Hi, and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is your host, Josh Newton. It is the second week of July. We have episode 43 coming at you. But before we do that, I want to let you know about Servit Solutions. Servit Solutions is a health management platform that really bases its whole program on two defining factors. Number one, the concept of pen density and keeping animal numbers low and reducing the amount of uh, bacteria buildup on the landscape. And number two is the use of our custom-made vaccine products. Uh, Many of you uh, who do listen use our products. We greatly appreciate you, and uh, I just want to kick this out as an offer to you. We are running a program right now where we're offering free diagnostics. Yes, that's free diagnostics. So, for example, let's just say you have... Uh, some animals or an animal that is sick and uh, it has pneumonia it ends up dying we will pay for that necropsy Uh, let's say that you have an animal that has uh, fusobacterium and it's got a lump on the side of its face Uh, we will uh, pay for the diagnostics on that so you would knock that animal down get a swab get that over to the lab we'll get that all cultured up and give you a determinative factor of what that is and that way you know how to treat it so that uh that program is going to go on here um uh, probably for a month or so and what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get some uh, diagnostics out of the lab and expand the coverage of our uh, current vaccine products and perhaps even Um, offer some additional ones. So if that's something that interests you, if you're interested in uh, some free diagnostics, give me a call. It's uh, 844-478-2870. You can shoot me an email. Those are going to be listed right there uh, below as I say them. So check those out. We have a great show for you today on North American Deer Talk. We have a returning guest and we'll get to him right now. Hey everyone, welcome back to North American Deer Talk. We have Dr. Chris Seabury on the line here. How are you, Doc? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing really well. I appreciate you coming back on. I I had been, you know, following our our last podcast. And for those listening, um, if you want some really deep context on uh, the topic that we're talking about, and that's chronic wasting disease, check out episode 38, um, GPS CWD. And um, it'll it'll lend some insight into some of the things we're going to cover. But um, I want to cover some some new ground um, as I as I kind of you know take the the CWD journey and I I continue down the road. It seems like um, just in the past month since we last talked, there's been some new papers written. I've seen some articles come out, you know, citing you know the new hope and and the, you know the whatever you want to call it uh, relating to to chronic wasting disease. Um, so I, I, if we can just jump into it, that would be great. Um, I, I, and I said the new hope kind of tongue in cheek, cause that was the, the title of an article I read here out in, uh, in Pittsburgh, um, on the post gazette and <clears throat> relating to a paper, uh, a research paper, I guess, just recently released maybe a week or two ago, uh, by a, a, a group in uh, Canada, Debbie, Debbie McKenzie and, and crew. Um, have you got a chance to see that or it, it related to the 90 success? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I did. I did actually see it. I saw it probably, I don't know, a week or two ago, Gotcha. not, not very long ago, but. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Curious your thoughts on that. Cause I, I, as I, as I kind of, you know, first reading the news release and then like digging into the paper a little bit more, it, it seemed like we were tagging on to some old, old work or older or older ideas. Um, can you give us well, a breakdown of some of the, the things that she had covered? Yeah, let me, the, the, uh, I, I guess what I would say is, um, let me turn off my email. So it won't yeah, sure. ding. <clears throat> you know, the new hope is not really new. I mean, we, you know, I guess a year before that we published a paper that showed actually for the first time quantified the effects of the 96S allele, um, the direction of the effect in a proper inheritance model, as well as the effect size. Um, So we already knew that the 96S allele with increasing copy number leads to reduced susceptibility, right? So that's that's not new. 
Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that is new is that she does sort of this cell-free in vitro amplification assay that is uh, PMCA. Um, <clears throat> I believe it was PMCA that she used and shows that you know, it doesn't amplify beyond a certain round of, uh, you know, cyclic amplification rounds. And so there's a deduction there that, you know, that that might be mechanistically the basis for why the 96S allele biochemically reduces susceptibility. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, we've, everyone has always believed that most of, some people believe all of, the amplification efficiency and progression of disease is related to um, refolding the amplification efficiency or refolding PRPC into PRPCWD, right? And so the problem is, is that this is done in a cell-free assay, right? It's not done in, in vivo with animals or in cells that are alive that are expressing all the other proteins and enzymes that may be contributory um, to this, right? To this disease process. And I, and, and, and that's kind of, you know, even in the paper, it, it, it says that these results that she, uh, has put forth are in contrast or in conflict with a, with a, with a new 2020 paper that is referenced in there. Right. And so, you know, there's that. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, last time I was on the podcast, I told you I did an experiment where I take the prion gene out, right? And I reestimate the heritability and it doesn't change a whole lot, right? Well, that's new for this type of big data analysis, right? It's not really a new concept because, you know, there's, there's at least three papers that have been published that show that TSE incubation time in mice and other traits related to TSEs are variable in a way that is independent of the prion gene. And, you know, these are inbred mice that have the exact same prion gene. It's identical by descent. There's no genetic variation there. So you can't attribute variation in incubation time to different codon variants in the prion gene because there's, there's none there, right? That's analogous to me taking the prion data out of the DEER data set, right? And reestimating the heritability. And strikingly, when I do that, the number I get is almost identical to the number they get. And papers that go all the way back, you know, 2010, 2000, 1983, you know? So it's not to say that the prion gene is not involved or not important, or that 96S is not important. It's that, you know, this new hope is not new, but also we have 20 96SSs right now that are CWD positive enrolled in a recent study and paper that's a follow up to what we did before, right? We had 11 in that paper. That's new. We had, we have 20 96 SSs in a new paper that are CWD positive, And one of them isn't just lymph node positive, it's lymph node and OBEX positive. And we had that one before. So that clearly shows that 96 SS is not fully resistant. And if it is allowed to stay long enough infected, that some of them can in fact progress to being OBEX positive, right? So time, you know, time is obviously not not friendly on that uh, particular model of, of genotyping or, or having, you know, single breeding for single, those single alleles types, um, as opposed to, you know, a more broad perspective. Um, and and I, I, I think as we look through, you know, if, if we look through time and we say, like this, this isn't necessarily a sheep model, a scrapie model, right? Like it's not, it's the deer are different, right? They, they, they are different animals. Um, can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Cause I think there's this, um, 
there's this bit of confusion where we, we, we perhaps think that we can, you know, recreate the, the Scrapey program identical to what it was. Um, yeah. and, 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 and that, I don't think that's necessarily, well, it's not true. Like it's, we've, we've, you, you've proven that, that that's not the, the correct route to go. Can you just comment a little bit more about that? Yeah, actually, that's a great question because there's a new paper by Justin Greenlee about CWD and Scrapey that's important uh, in the context of that. And we can, you know, we, I, I want to revisit that, but so we've known about Scrapey since the 1700s, okay? We, we've recognized Scrapey as a disease since the 1700s. And so let's just do some very practical, simple ballpark math, okay? That's 300 years worth of at least minimally, minimally 300 years that we've recognized Scrapey, that sheep have, you know, co-adapted where you have the host trying to adapt to the pathogen and the pathogen trying to adapt to the host, okay? So there's this kind of tug of war battle, right? Mm -hmm. And for the host to be successful in perpetuating itself, it needs to be able to overcome the pathogen, right? And so, you know, what is the gestation period of sheep? Like 150 days? So you can get, you know, two lambs per year on average, right? Mm -hmm. 300 years, right? 300 years? Yeah. What, what is that? 600 generations? 600 generations worth of worth of uh, of that host pathogen tug of war, right? We'll see now in sheep. After all that time, what we see is that it's a it's a fairly clean trait, right? It's it's fairly simple. Most of the most of the variation and susceptibility can be explained by the, a collection of three codons in the prion gene, right? Um, it's not perfect, but it's, it's, you know, it's pretty robust in terms of scrapey resistance. Well, if we consider that one main origin of CWD is scrapey or the main origin, which has already been hypothesized in the literature and certainly alluded to in this new Greenlee paper, right, where some of those results show that CWD and scrapey are indistinguishable. Okay. How long, long have white-tailed deer, for instance, had CWD? You know, I mean, it could only go back to like the 60s, right? Where we first had a description of CWD in captive uh, mule deer at a wildlife facility, right? And then it's kind of spilled over after that. So what is that? How many generations is that? You know, that was what, 50 years ago or less? Yeah, right? you say call it 50, 50, 60 years ago, yeah. Yeah, so, so we have essentially one sixth of the amount of generational time that white-tailed deer, for instance, minimally, uh, have sort of been in this same co-adaptation battle, right? And so the, the, the infection, the disease itself is arguably younger than scrapey, right? And so the expectation is, what would you expect to see from a genetic, quantitative genetic point of view? Well, what you'd expect to see is a dirtier trait, something that's not easily explained, you know, as easily and cleanly and, and uh, robustly as sheep scrapey. And that's exactly what we see, exactly what we see. We see that there are many, many more genetic elements that contribute to risk or susceptibility or the reduction in susceptibility. And we see very, very few moderate or large effect SNPs in the, in the, in the prion gene, right? And, and most of the ones that are the most beneficial are exceedingly you know, more rare, like 95H, right? It does have a small protective effect, but it's rare. 96S is much more common. It's got the largest protective effect, but it's incomplete, okay? Because like I said, we have 20 96 SSs that are CWD positive enrolled in a 
current study and we're going to add more. And one of them is even brain positive. So how many, how many tests does it take to put you out of business that are positive, Josh? Let's just be practical. One. One. Okay. So from a practical point of view, the new hope of only selecting on 96S is not going to deliver you a, a maximum amount of protection that that you could in fact receive. You're not putting on that full armor of protection, right? It's easier to think about if you want to, you know, if, if easy is what you want, then easy is what you'll get. But um, even from just a practical point of view, the way that we've set up everything to move forward with this, with USDA um, and with uh, NADR is you're going to get the breeding values. You're going to get all the prion codon genotypes. And if you ordered parentage, you're going to get that too. The price of which is unbeatable. Why wouldn't you want all that information? There's nowhere else that you can go to get all that information, right? And so- Yeah, it's so easy. I, it's and, like here, it's on a platter. It's on a platter. And the, and the 96 SSs that we have that are CWD positive all have bad breeding value. So what does that tell you? Now the best deer that we see have good breeding values and they're 96 SS. Mm -hmm. It's just, you're, 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 you want to select for all the good stuff at the same time, right? Because if you don't, you might end up with a 96 SS and it's, it's got the good stuff at code on 96, but it doesn't have the rest of the good stuff. And that doesn't deliver to you the level of protection that you're looking for, right? From a practical point of view. So if I, I, and I just, I guess I want to reiterate this point because um, it, it's, I, I've seen it before. I've seen this point made that, you know, the value of 96 S SS um, is that the, the lymphatic system is doing its job. It's, it's acting as a filter, which it should. And that these animals have not of Ben Obex positive, but that that's that's now been disproven. Like you're, you know, you, you, I heard you say it. I just, I guess, I'll ask you to say it again. We have a 96 SS that is Obex positive. That is correct. Yeah, we do. Okay. So, and, and I, I, I honestly, I expect more. You know, like, and 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 I expect any 96 SS that we encounter to be positive, also to have you know, sort of uh, inferior risk breeding values, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that could go across a range, right? But um, that, in fact, that's what we see with all of them so far. Gotcha. And that's the expectation. Um, let's touch a little bit more on the, the scrapey side of things, because I, I find that very, very interesting. Um, I haven't, I, I have very little experience with scrapey. I know what it is. I don't know the markers. I, I know that they've had a, a successful eradication slash breeding program to eradicate it or, or, or bring that prevalence way, way down. Um, can you just run through that and then maybe um, tie that into CWD and, and deer? Yeah, so uh, scrapie and sheep, you know, is the codon 136, 154, 171. Um, and you know, the, the, the so-called scrapey resistant sheep are the ARR, ARR, you know, sheep. But again, you know, we have minimally 600 generations worth of selection that's been ongoing, not only by nature, mother nature, but by, by man who, you know, has domesticated sheep, right? And recognize the disease all the way back in, in 1700, you know? So, We've had a long time to um, sort of have this battle between host pathogen and animal husbandry selection, right? Um, and that being the case, we, uh, we have sheep now that we can clearly identify that are robust to scrapey, right? And we just haven't had, in my opinion, nearly as long to be dealing with CWD, naturally or otherwise, 
And so what we're trying to do is sort of accelerate that process, right? Because this, this is an important point, actually, now that I, you brought it up. Um, what would you consider if I said to you, let's just pretend that 96S is your best hope. What would you consider um, if I told you that that allele was so important that it could become the dominant allele in deer populations in a short period of time, right? Through mother nature's natural selection, right? Mm -hmm. What would you consider a short period of time? Um, in, in mother nature's world? In deer farmer, mother nature's world, well, you know, non-scientist world. I mean, what would that I mean? Practically, what would that mean to the lay public, right? Yeah, I, I, today's world of, of Amazon deliveries and, <laughs> and all that stuff. I mean, not a decade. Okay. That's, that's probably a long time, right? Right. Well, so somebody actually, that there's a paper cited in the, in the, uh, the paper that we were discussing earlier about uh, 96S, you know, selecting on that as a, as a new hope. And it, it actually says that, that, you know, 96S is, you know, basically so beneficial that it could become the dominant allele uh, in a population in a short period of time. And, you know, that paper that it cites shows that the, the selection coefficient is 1%. Okay, so it's going to take like a <laughs> hundred plus least. years least. theoretically yep. before that could ever happen, right? So that, that, that brings up an important point, like bison in Yellowstone National Park. This is unrelated to CWD, right? They've had brucellosis for a long time, mm -hmm. long time. They've had bovine brucellosis, which is a facultative intracellular bacterial pathogen for a long time. Why aren't they resistant to it by now? I don't know. If that's, if, if that's how mother nature works. Yeah, it, why, why aren't they resistant to it by now? Well, they should be under the, the, the thought that the paper had cited. Yeah. The, the, the reason is that there is not a large enough fitness advantage and the selection coefficient is therefore small, mm. okay? Because unless a disease is very aggressive, very virulent, very, very rapid and acute, and it is, it is preventing reproduction, right? Because it is so virulent and acute, right? So all the animals that are moderately to highly susceptible, right? And it, it's rapidly transmissible. All those animals are, are basically dying before they can pass on their susceptible alleles to the, to the future you know, population members, right? And so what you're left with then is, are animals that are either insufficiently exposed or naturally resistant, okay? Well, that can only happen if there's a big fitness advantage, okay? And thus the selection coefficient is not tiny. Right. So in this case, um, you know, from what I saw, it's, it's not very rapid. Okay. Um, and that does jive with, you know, what we see in our study based on the effect size of 96 S it's true that it reduces susceptibility, but it, it doesn't, uh, have the same level of, of impact on, reducing this, the susceptibility as what we see in sheep scrapie. But again, you know, we've had those sheep coexisting with scrapie now for 600 plus generations, hundreds of years. We haven't had that with, with white-tailed deer and CWD. And so the host response, the white-tailed deer host response based on its current genetic composition is much more complicated, right? And we don't, we don't have genetic elements that as a singular genetic element explain as much of the risk or variation in susceptibility as what we see in sheep scrapie, right? 
Now, left to wild populations left to their own devices for hundreds of years and, and hundreds of generations, you know, would that work itself out? Sure, probably, yeah, maybe, but yeah, maybe. But you know, we're I think we're all looking for a solution today, right? For sure. And today, the best solution that we have is through the the genomic prediction that, you know, in the, in a recent project I did, it was I had a overall rolling average of like eighty nine percent, right? I, I just don't think that. It's just going to be hard to get much better than that. You know what I mean? Right. So let me, uh, uh, I guess, let me ask you a, a, a similar type question uh, to one that's been posed to me. If if I had, if I had, if I did not know breeding values on animals, now you had stated that all 96 SS animals with that ha have gone positive all have bad breeding values. So I, I know that when I ask this question, but if I just had a herd of 96 SSs, right? And I just kept breeding them and I had infection, right? Like I, I had known CWD there, but I, I used the animals that lived or that weren't dying of disease. And I, I worked a breeding program, I could, probably breed out of that over time, but the you would have just catastrophic death loss. Is that something that could be done? I mean, could I just take 96 SSs and breed for like 40 years in a in a positive facility and then ultimately have a an animal that maybe was resistant or has very low susceptibility? Not that I'd want to, but like, could that be done? It, it could be done, but it really would have to be done a certain way, which isn't the way people normally do this type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is you're rolling the dice. So what happens if all the 96 S's that you currently possess are like the ones that we have that are positive? In other words, they're SS's, but they have bad breeding values. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna breed your way out of that? You know, because you don't have any animals that have the good stuff at other genetic locations other than the prion gene, right? Yeah. Or they don't have enough of it. So how do you how do you get yourself out of that? You know, it's 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 inescapable. Yeah. You're you're just sort of breeding within that breeding value range, right? So you're inevitably going to have some degree of positives there if in fact, you know, these animals are, you know, routinely exposed, right? And so the other problem, so so if you had a, if you took 96 SSs from all over the, you know, United States that are more distantly related, right, so that you have the chance that some of them have good breeding values in addition to being 96 SS, which means they have other beneficial genetics other than the 96 SS, right, and you bred that same experiment that you talked about just now, you could be successful with that, but why would you want to do that? You 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 could make it so much easier on yourself to to not have to go through all that to identify these are the deer that have the best breeding values. Some of them are, for instance, GS, right? Let's make let's make SSs now with the deer that have the best breeding values. So now you 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 started off with something more than what you would have had in the first example that I gave you. Um, and you, you, you actually brought your idea of a breeding program to a conclusion much more rapidly based on the second example I gave, because taking them from all these other distant places so that they have greater degrees of genetic variation, all that, all that would do is increase the probability that they have some of, the, some of those animals have the good stuff in other locations other than the prion gene. Just going to take you longer to find them through your breeding experiment than it would have if we just found them for you to begin with, right? So, so uh, in in my scenario to you, if I did that with without knowing the breeding values, and I again positive facility, I used that ninety six SS um, model, and I bred up after I had potentially achieved success. If we then tested those animals 
um, you would say the breeding values on those would have to be good. We, that's what we'd probably be fine. They'd have to be decent, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, you know, when 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 you start when you start throwing you know your examples and mine together, and you just look at it from a real world perspective, the the idea that um, the single allele is is meaningless. It, it's not. It's it's a matter of of verifying, and and I think you use a, a great term, armor and an insurance policy. And you, you do this layered effect. The breeding values is simply another metric to look at, right? And it should be the basis for everything to work off of. And there's nothing wrong with having those S alleles there. You just, you want them layered on with the, uh, the appropriate low susceptible breeding values or negative breeding values. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 like I said before, it, this idea that there's a large amount of variation that can be explained in TSE incubation time or other aspects of TSE biology that's independent of the prion gene is not, that's not really a new concept. That's been published since <clears throat> beginning like in 1983. You know, I gave, I'll give you some links and you can put them on your podcast for at least two studies that are easier to understand. Okay. Very easy to understand. Sure. Um, uh, and even if you just only read the abstract, okay? Yeah, we'll drop, we'll drop those in the show notes below for the people. And so people them. see that there are these other genetic elements that impact of the, of the TSEs, right? Sorry, I just had, a, we major, drop off? I just had a major power surge. Uh, I apologize. I don't know what that was. Uh, so I, yeah, we're yeah, we're still we're still good. Sorry about that, folks. I uh, I just got hit with like a triple triple power surge, but we're on the backup generator, so we're all good. So, anyway, you know that being the case, in those papers, if you only just read the abstract, you'll see that, you know, how can you possibly explain differences in incubation period and diff other differences in disease path um, pathology that are completely unrelated to the prion gene? unless there are other genetic elements that are contributory, right? So last time on the podcast, I told you, I did an experiment to prove that, all right? I, I did it again. I, I did something else for you this time. I love it. I went in, I took the whole prion data set out and I did a genomic prediction using um, cross-validation machine learning approach, right? And the accuracy that I get is, you know, it, it, it's, it's not as high as with the prion data, but it, it certainly is in the ballpark of the same degree of accuracy, right? I get, I get a few percentage points lower uh, in terms of, of, of accuracy, um, but I don't lose all accuracy. And so, you know, it's just, it's, it's exactly like those other studies. It, even the heritability of 0 0.6 is almost identical. So you, you, you can't, you know, you can't just in favor of, you know, just because people favor simple solutions to complex problems, that doesn't mean that they're correct. All right. So you can't sort of ignore all these studies that have been done and, and think that you're just going to do a sheep scrapey approach and be good. You can do that, but some people are going to end up with animals like the ones we have that are 96 SSs that are that are positive, right? Because they just don't have enough of the good stuff elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not uh, I'm not near uh, piped into the CWD world, at least from a, a research and project standpoint, as you are. Um, but it appears to me, and maybe I'm just looking harder, uh, much like we look for, for chronic wasting disease and we, we find it, right? But I'm seeing more and more papers, you know, be, be published on these types of things that seem very uh, correlated and, and direct towards um, maybe mule deer, whitetail, elk, but, you know, ser cervid species C CWD, right? Um, is there anything else that you've either been working on or, or have seen that you think would be, uh, you know, worthwhile to, to discuss here uh, to complement the rest of our, our conversation? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, we're we're always working on something, but um, you know, I uh, I did like 300 elk genome sequences the other day to to um, you know work toward a similar uh, approach, and I already had some additional ones, but anyway, to sort of work towards a sim similar approach in elk. Um, I've already built at least the blueprint for a mule deer um, array similar to the whitetail, but there's just not a demand for that because of, you know, here in the state of Texas, we're not allowed to farm mule deer anymore. I saw, I saw somewhere some new regulation, I believe that mm. came out that, that, that was relatively new. I think it covered mule deer and their hybrids, but I, you know, don't quote me on that, but I, I don't think we're allowed to do that anymore. Um, and so anyway, USDA APHIS also just doesn't have the stakeholder demand for action in the area of, um, you know, mule deer farming where CWD is concerned. So um, I don't know that that's going to happen. I also have been sort of doing what's known as a genotype by environment interaction analysis. So, you know, a good example would be crop breeders, you know, at any, at, at, at most, at most universities that have a big ag program, they have crop breeders and the crop breeders come up with particular crop lines that perform better in certain soil types in certain regions of the United States based on, you know, 30 year climate data and soil type and soil pH and soil compositions. Um, and so <clears throat> a good example of a genotype by environment interaction would be, for instance, if we have two crop lines, crop line one and crop line two, crop line one will outperform two on low pH soils, right? But two will outperform one on high pH soils in terms of yield. So it's inverse, right? <laughs> And so the, the, the productivity, how good it is, is related to the environment that they're in. And it's statistically significant. So it's a genotype by environment interaction. The same thing happens with cattle for production traits. We've been working on that um, with, uh, with Missouri, with a, with a friend of mine, um, a good colleague for a long time. And so it's well known that we get these sort of genotype by environment interactions that for instance, influence production traits in cattle, beef cattle, right? Well, it's no different with disease, all right? So we've been applying some of that logic to CWD to ask the research question, <clears throat> are there any, in a genome-wide analysis, are there any SNPs that are significantly associated with CWD in certain regions, right? But not in others, or a better way to put it is, are there genetic risk factors that enhance susceptibility in one region of the United States, but have a different effect somewhere else? And the answer is yes. So we've actually been able to identify some of that. And in doing some of that, you know, just and some other peripheral analyses, we, we probably have identified, I don't know, up to 40 new genes that are somehow involved in differences in susceptibility to CWD, right? Just as positional candidate genes, um, where the SNP that is significant is either in that gene or, or right next to that gene um, on the chromosome. So <clears throat> clearly everything that we've been doing suggests that without upstaging it, I'm not going to get into precise numbers, but everything that we've been doing continues to show that CWD is a more complex disease than has previously been appreciated, okay? And that there are more genetic elements influencing the pathophysiology of disease than has been appreciated. And, you know, one of the things that we sort of ignore or don't focus on is 
the actual timing of events also. Like, even if we had a room full of experts, academic and government scientists, and we said, raise your hand if you can explain to us the step by step in detail, every step from exposure to being brain positive biochemically. Someone tell us that. Nobody knows the answer to that question, mm. right? And, and the details of that are where a lot of this, a, a lot of the non prion related heritability is tied up in elements of the timing and the trafficking uh, and things like that. The, the, the things going on biochemically uh, along the way, right? That can be synergistic, that can reduce or, you know, incubation times make the disease um, seem much more aggressive, right? And, 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 and the pathology much more uh, rapid versus the opposite of that. And so a lot of that is not studied, right? Because it's kind of intractable. It's such a large topic in research space that you can get lost in that unless you focus on a, a little particular area. And so instead of trying to define the boundaries of that or trying to focus on one little area that doesn't have a necessarily a, a practical application to reducing the prevalence now, we've been doing these genome-wide analyses where we try to look for genetic associations and ways that we can predict things or enhance predictions. And so we we found actually quite a bit more than was discussed in our last um, paper. And of course, some of the things that we find are, are directly related to genes known to uh, influence the pathophysiology of scraping. You know, so no, no big surprise there, right? Um, that's really interesting, the, um, the, what you just described. When you, when you first went through, I remember, uh, I think it was your, your uh, presentation on your completed paper. Uh, it, it may have been the Nadifa one, I, I, I can't remember. But you had, you had made the comment about um, doing some like external analysis outside of, of, and maybe it was environmental or, or something, outside of the um, simple genetic evaluation. Um, and you had actually found that the genetic evaluation was was more predictive by a couple points than adding in other factors, maybe age, environment, things like that were there. I, I'm not sure. Um, are you finding as you as you kind of churn through this data more and more and more, are you finding that maybe you're going to question that again? Is that what you're indicating? No, I mean, I, I. Uh, <clears throat> A matter of fact, I did some calculations this morning on that very subject, and um, you know, it's it's sort of important to understand that just because you can find some, you know, a handful, a dozen, a couple dozen SNPs that have significant genotype by environment interactions, doesn't necessarily mean that um, that that is going to derail and perturb the, excuse me, genomic prediction or genetic evaluation program, right? Because even if there's two dozen of them, right? That's two dozen out of a 120 plus thousand SNPs that have non-zero effects on risks, right? Or non-zero effect on susceptibility. And so, you know, you can test the hypothesis that genomic predictions with or without accounting for that, you know, makes a significant difference. And, you know, it, it, uh, it doesn't make a big difference, but it does bring to light a lot of biology that is important, that has not been recognized, that can tie back to papers that were published 30 years ago, you know? And, and bring, continue to bring many, many more 
new things to light, you know? You had, um, we were we were just chatting offline and you, you had made a comment to me and I wrote it down because I thought it was interesting um, about uh, science getting in a rut. Um, and that, you know, if we, and maybe I'll let you characterize it um, as opposed to me doing that. But um, what is what does that mean? Can you expand on that a little more in relationship to, to CWD and what that looks like? I mean, it's. It, it, I guess it would be unfair to say that or to characterize a scientific rut exclusively related to CWD because I think it, it happens in all facets and aspects of science, no matter what the subject matter or topic of, of study is, right? right? But it but it does happen, you know, where we sort of just keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. You know, I mean when we when we look at the paper that we published, right? And we know that 96 SS is 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 uh, the largest, you know, codon 96 is the largest effect region of the genome, but it doesn't explain enough variants or risks to be used as a standalone breeding item because we have 20 positives that are SS and one brain positive. I mean, that's just that's just practical sort of common sense logic that if it only takes one positive test to put you out of business, then you might want to contemplate putting on the full armor um, to give yourself a greater degree of, of protection. Alternatively, if it seems too complicated for you to think about it and you're married to the genotyping only the, the prion gene, then I think that <clears throat> that's an easier thing to contemplate, okay? Because you don't really necessarily have to learn anything new uh, in terms of trying to manage your, your deer herd. You can just keep doing something like that. But you're not going to get the benefits uh, out of doing that, that you're going to, the same level of benefits that you're going to get from the breeding values plus the prion codon. So this, this sort of rut thing happens all the time, right? And it, it, it happens for sort of a reason. Sometimes it happens because we reach kind of a plateau scientifically and we're having trouble pushing past that plateau, right? Like we've made some even significant gains scientifically, but then we reach a plateau that seems like it cannot be surpassed. And so we end up in a rut. Sometimes we end up in a rut because, you know, <clears throat> you, it's, it's fairly easy to publish papers when you predicate what you've done on what somebody else did. So if they did it and it's okay, then it must be okay for me to do it, right? And, and there's some degree of that that happens also, if I'm being honest and fair. But it's, it's a lot more work scientifically um, to, for every scientist to try to push themselves beyond their plateau and beyond their limit, because that's how we get past those ceilings, those scientific plateaus that seem uh, impassable, is for scientists to push themselves past their own plateaus, right? to come up with new ideas and to get uncomfortable and to try new things. It, it should be a continuous learning process, you know? It has to be. If you if you sort of wanna if you sort of wanna remain in a in a competitive place scientifically, um, where you're most useful to your institution, to the stakeholders, to to everyone, right? And so, you know, like I said, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that you know, a rut is specific only to this because it happens everywhere. But yes, we have been, despite papers that clearly show other genetic elements are important in TSEs, in mouse models, in white-tailed deer with chronic wasting disease, we still have people who are enamored with the idea of only selecting on the prion genotypes. And the, prob the other problem is, besides not getting the full protection, is that if you think that you're not going to drag with that some unintended consequences through negative recessive alleles, the 
that you can't see with your eyes, you're wrong because it's going to happen. And some of those could even be synergistic with increasing susceptibility, as evidenced by the 20 positive 96 SSs that we have that have bad breeding values. So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that part there. I want to, I want to shift gears and I want to get into, um, the, the practical world. And, okay. and I have a couple, I have a couple questions, uh, a <clears throat> little more off topic, uh, but, but very much relating to the, the technology that you've built. Okay. So, um, the and we we touched on this a little bit before in the first podcast we're gonna we're gonna chat about it now um the the technology that you've built is simply being used currently for chronic wasting disease and its evaluation right there is the ability to look at many many other things right so and and i guess this is for my own uh personal um uh, satisfaction is that how do we, if we, if we're breeding, obviously for, for CWD based on breeding values, when you start adding other things in, let's just say they're basic deer diseases, E. coli, fusobacterium, mycoplasma, whatever, you come up with a hundred different bacteria that, that deer get, how does that layered effect work? What does that look like maybe to the producer when you do that evaluation, you say, okay, how do we, how do we marry chronic wasting disease and fusobacterium, right? Like how, how does, what does that look like? Cause I'm just not, I, I, I suspect there's similar things done in, in Holstein's um, um, that you've already worked on. What does that look like? Usually you get like multi-trait weighted selection models that you employ for things like that. Um, and it can get a bit complicated because there can sometimes be traits that are antagonistic to one another. So if we pull on the genetics for one thing, we, we get a negative something else. I mean, this, this is sort of happened in the U.S. dairy industry where, you know, we pulled on milk production very successfully. And inevitably, we ended up with a reduction in fertility and in U.S. dairy cattle, right? And so now we're kind of trying to balance that out. And there's been several projects that we've worked on. And a lot of other people have worked on this area too. So <clears throat> the, 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 the truth is the way that I built the technology, there's a way to make a mistake when you build this technology. You, you could have built it so that it was super specific to CWD. And if you did that, you boxed yourself into a corner, okay? Um, <clears throat> because <clears throat> you would have introduced a lot of bias into it. It wouldn't have been, without getting into the weeds, it wouldn't have been the most appropriate thing to use for EHD or blue tongue or TB or, you know, sure. respiratory disease or E. coli, fuso, foot rot, what, whatever, you know? It wouldn't have been, but the way I designed it, I had that in mind. So it, it is designed properly to be able to be used for any other heritable trait. But in the case of CWD, because it's a reportable disease and because um, animal husbandry and, and um, livestock production ends with one positive CWD test, you know, that has to be the front runner and probably worked on exclusively first. Um, and then we can start sort of evaluating other traits, right? Having genetic evaluations um, for other traits as well, right? And that's going to require organizations like, I believe you have an organization in your state. We do. Um, it's gonna, it's gonna entail some degree of coordination between the producers, because for instance, once you run your animals on, on the, the new 50K array, which I'm told is almost ready. <laughs> We're all excited for it. <laughs> 
uh, there was a few wrinkles to iron out, but I'm, I'm, I feel pretty good that most of them are, have been well ironed out. It's good to hear. Um, but for instance, once you run all your animals over there, you get your breeding values for CWD, which accounts for prion, codon genotypes also, but you also get those back. So now you know how to make a 96 SS with the best breeding values, right? By looking at your animals and constructing a breeding program. But see, you've already run the array now. So if you keep good records on your animals, right? Especially as it relates to animal health issues, then <clears throat> over time, uh, after we accumulate enough animals um, and have some coordination through various um, organizations like yours, then we can actually do a genetic evaluation for other traits of interest, right? And the people that opt in <clears throat> will enable everyone um, in that capacity mm. going forward, which basically we have a vehicle to do genetic improvement in, you know, whitetail deer farming as a non-traditional livestock industry. Um, <clears throat> but the first, you know, problem that has to be significantly mitigated is CWD, obviously, right? Um, so I, I like, I like that. I like the fact that, you know, I feel like our, if you look at the servant industry, you know, the first, we'll call them commercial style operations were from the seventies, right? Um, at least in the private sector. And then, you know, you, you get run off from that into the eighties and, and you really saw a big boom in the late nineties and, and early two thousands. And I feel like as a, as a, a, you know, a servant industry, a farm servant industry, we're starting to see technologies available like the one you've created. And I feel like we're kind of coming into our, our own and, and, and it's, it's becoming more established um, from animal health standpoint, which is really good. Um, so number one, thank you for, for, for building that because I think it has uh, long-term implications well outside of CWD because I, I personally believe that we'll be able to, um, uh, much like the Scrapey program, develop a, a, a program for, for servants here in the United States and perhaps in other, other areas, you know, Canada, et cetera, that have CWD problems and, and then we can turn our eyes towards some other site. Um, so I have a, um, a, uh, a somewhat uh, dreamer mind, if you will, right? And I, I, I like hypotheticals. I suspect um, uh, you, you have some visionary um, uh, place in your mind, but I suspect you have a lot more analytical place in your mind because of the data that you have to, to crunch and the math you do. Um, that I don't, I don't have. So if, if you don't want to, if you don't want to tire yourself down to some of these questions, you, you don't have to, but. No, the creative, the creative place in my mind is where I go for a vacation. Okay. Well, we're going to go there right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So CWD positive facilities, um, they, if they, do you think there's the ability for, um, this technology to be implemented in some capacity in, let's just say, index facilities, depending on various factors, environmental contamination, uh, pre unloaded stuff, where we can start um, shifting the course of the prevalence uh, within a positive yeah. facility? No, I, I think that, you know what? I'm so glad you asked me that question because it's a great question and I've been working on that here in my home state, actually, because, you know, I think that we need to move into a phase where, <clears throat> where we um, attempt to clean up a positive facility. And some facilities are better candidates than others for doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've had here in the state of Texas, for instance, a facility that had one trace out deer, right? So it was on hold and quarantine. Oh. Um, the trace out deer was euthanized. It was positive. Every other deer in the facility was then euthanized and not a single one of them was positive, okay? I think that there's a problem there with that. And the problem is 
um, you know, when things like that happen, okay, that the problem that that facility had came from a trace out. That particular facility now that had, I don't know, two, 300 other animals, I don't remember, it was at least 200, I think. Um, you don't know what you're losing there, right? So if, if you've got this genetic, this germplasm out there, right, that is untested, you could have just lost some of, you know, the more valuable deer in terms of breeding values that cannot be used now, you know, for addressing the problem, okay? And so I think that trying to clean up some of these facilities uh, and, and trying to demonstrate that it can be done I think some of them can be done. Um, and in this case, let's just pretend that the trace out deer was the only positive, okay? And let's just pretend that we started live testing the deer, right? Uh -huh. And we also did the GPS on them yep. and we reduced the herd down to only the best deer. You know, there's some possibility there that we could ride out a five year quarantine, right? Or maybe not even need that long if we could sort of prove that we could clean up some of these herds and then maintain the the good genetics that are needed to continue to address the problem. And by continuing the live tests and identifying those genetics, we could put up semen on those sires, right? We could even test the semen with the uh, RT quick or PMCA to ensure that it was safe, even though nobody's proven that CWD in the semen is transmittable to a doe and the fawns by breeding, but I'm just saying, sure. um, you know, we, if, if I'm dreaming in a creative space, these are the things that we ought to be doing, but, you know, and the problem is, is that there's things that get in the way of that. Politics gets in the way of that. Um, the, the, the regulatory burden of being a positive facility here in my state and other states, that gets in the way of it because you've got the the landowner and the breeder who now is, you know, taking a fairly significant economic loss and has to feed these animals and maintain them uh, for a research project um, with an unknown outcome. And also with 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 a sort of a lack of commitment as to whether or not, um, even if it's successful, whether they can, um, you know, take themselves out of quarantine, basically. But I, I think that we have to start going down that road. I mean, that that is the ultimate diamond in the ring, is to go to a positive facility and be able to demonstrate that it can be cleaned up. And that's going to have to include not just the genetic part, but best management practices, right? So I'm not a deer breeder, but if I was, I know that 10% or more bleach, excuse me, kills prions. So, you know, I'd have my bug sprayer full of bleach solution every day, spraying down my alley and anywhere that down the walls and yeah, the equipment shoot, you know, I, I'd be you know, I, I, I'd be Johnny on the spot, best right. management practices, doing my genetic stuff, probably even be cleaning all kinds of stuff, right? Um, and, 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 and I know it sounds a little bit funny, but I mean, it, it you know, if you want to stack the odds in your favor, I mean, you got to, you, you, you know, you can't be ashamed to take all armor the, to use. And that includes, in part, best management practices, right? So I, I would like to see us go there in the future to start doing something like that, uh, especially if we continue to see that, you know, Scrapey is the most logical likely origin of CWD, because in that case, we've got a livestock disease that spilled over into wildlife. And in this case, not even really wildlife, because in many states, deer like this are con considered livestock, right? Yep. And so this happens all the time. Um, it happens with BBDV. It happens with brucellosis. 
It happens with TB. I mean, it, it happens all the time, right? And you, you do your best to, to contain it, um, but we need the opportunity to explore ways to clean up positive facilities um, so that we can, you know, have ways to repurpose them, but also figure out, can we successfully do this? And if so, what's it gonna take, right? And then preserve any good genetics that are there, you know, so that they can be used um, to combat or mitigate CWD. Yeah, I, you made some really great points. And I know that many uh, of my, my fellow servant farmers have made, um, you know, similar kind of context uh, comments to me about it, where, you know, we've, we've looked at this eradication style model for 20 years now in the, in the, in the farm world. And, you know, number one, it, it has great economic burden to the, to the, the landowner and the animal owner. Um, but, you know, when you, when you say that the genetic material is gone um, and what we've lost, I don't think that can be understated. You, you, in, in not you, but when that happens, when, when we depopulate these herds without additional uh, research or at least data gathering, especially genetically, now that we have the tools to do it, we are potentially, we may have already killed some of the most valuable animals that have ever been. That may have already happened. No, we did, because I've got some of them. There you go. So <laughs> I just, it, 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 I, um, it, it can be, it can be a little infuriating. I think, um, you know, as our industry gets more exposure um, in a regulatory capacity, but also to the tech, like the technology that you created, um, and that bumps up against that regulatory body, um, it starts to, to penetrate, right? And then we start to have uh, regulators that say, well, let's try this, right? Let's, and, and we're seeing that like in our state of Pennsylvania, like we, we see the willingness of our animal health officials to participate in, in really kind of novel projects that have not been done before because of these types of technologies. So that's, I think that's great. I'm going to shift gears because I something popped off in my brain. I want to jump back to breeding values. Okay. Um, so uh, when when you know I when I think of like breeding values in my mind, I think of that the the, the graph or the chart that you've you've made. Um, and and let's just say that we have uh, two animals that both have uh, negative 0.03 breeding values, a buck and a doe, and we breed them together, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, is it possible for reversion on that breeding value scale when we breed those animals together? Are we gonna, can we go more towards zero or are you only gonna be, you know, at that minus 0.03, just like your mom and dad or better? No, I mean, we already, I thought we discussed this a little bit, but I, um, and, we, and being sort of halfway, the, the, the theoretical expectation of having a really good deer and a, uh, really mediocre deer and breeding them and having the offspring be theoretically somewhere in the middle of the two breeding values. You know, you can't, um, you know, if you're breeding good to good, you expect good, right? Correct. That, that's, that's a reasonable expectation. Yes. If you're breeding mediocre to mediocre, then that's what you need to expect as, as the offspring, right? You're, you're, you're not going to breed two deer that have a negative would you say negative 0.03 together and get a deer that's got a negative 0 0.50, okay? You, 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 that's not gonna happen. Gotcha. Um, so that was, the, that was the end of my, uh, my railroad tracks. Anything else that you wanted to cover before we, uh, we wrap up? No, I mean, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see that some things are being discussed or hear about it <clears throat> and that sort of there's new research ramping up in different places. I, I like to see that. Um, I just hope that, uh, you know, and, and as you know, we've, we've tried to sort of, um, we've tried to enable the, the, 
the people of the state of Pennsylvania, deer farmers, through a recent call for proposals as well as other states where we're trying to help as well. <clears throat> so we're hopeful that some of that will actually be approved for funding so that we can, you know, continue to, to, to do this work and enable people. Um, and, and that would basically sort of remove the some part of the financial burden or risk for people to to get involved. But you know, I think that there'll be a lot of tests done when the 50K becomes available later this month, early August. I think there'll be, regardless of what happens with these these funding situations. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're looking forward to that and. Um, Looking forward to getting some feedback from producers about that too. Yeah, for sure. Um, I uh, I'm glad that we got a chance to uh, connect again, and uh, certainly on the topic of of CWD, I I can uh, I can turn to you and and ask these questions. I think the the conversation is incredibly valuable because we we stay on current research um, as as you know you continue to develop your your programs and do new things. I think it's really interesting for the industry. To hear direct from you, um, we haven't we haven't really been able to to do that um, as much on on various things uh, throughout time. And and the biggest um, the biggest complaint that I get, you know, as someone in leadership for our state association, is you know a lack of communication. Uh, and and in today's day and age, for us to be able to you know you being in, in Texas and me being here in Pennsylvania to to do something like this. Um, and then put that out for everybody to consume is is just it, it's it's pretty incredible what technology can do. Of course, we all take it for granted uh, at this point. But I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and doing this with me. Um, I know I'll have more more questions here in the future. Um, so again, thank you. I, I appreciate yeah, it. No, I, I appreciate it, too. Thank you. Yeah. And with that, folks, we'll wrap up. As always, stay tuned for another episode of North American Deer Talk.